Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's uh, presentation. It's uh, creating a legacy, planning for the intergenerational wealth transfer of your home. We are joined tonight by Michael Stone, who I will introduce momentarily. Uh, first, I just wanna remind everybody that we are being recorded this evening. Uh, you can check back on Facebook and on our website and actually watch this whenever you'd like. So if you have to pop in and out, no worries. Um, also, no worries about taking notes, uh, if that's the case. Um, we will have a question and answer session at the end this evening. Michael will be with us speaking for about 45 minutes, and then the rest of the time up through 7 p.m. We'll take as many questions as we can. Um, but please note that our chat will be disabled. So put your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. And I'll go through those all at the end and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, also, Michael was kind enough to offer to answer the ones uh, that he's able to answer after the fact. So we will send out a follow-up email to everybody with a link to the recording, any materials that might pop up during this hour that you guys would like to see more of and um, any questions that we didn't get to. So keep a lookout for that. You'll get it sometime in the next week or so from us. Uh, other than that, we have our garden contest is gonna start ramping up uh, as of June 1st. So keep a lookout for that in your emails and on our website. And um, I think that is all of the business I have to attend to with you guys. So let me introduce Michael formally now. Michael Stone is the legal director for the Center for Disability and Elder Law. As legal director, Michael ensures that the quality of CDEL's legal services, uh, ensures the high quality of CDEL's legal services, supervises the work of staff attorneys, interns, and volunteer attorneys. He partners with the executive director on the development of legal strategies and also represents clients in certain matters. Michael began his legal career at the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis as an associate attorney in the firm's corporate department. He later served as general counsel for the Cook County Assessor's Office and chief deputy assessor of the Cook County Assessor. He's also served as chief of staff to the Illinois State Toll Highway Authority. Prior to joining CDEL, Michael was an attorney in private practice. Michael has served as a keystone leader for the John T. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation's Preservation Compact. A MacArthur Foundation and Urban Land Institute led task force on preserving affordable housing. He was also a member of Mayor Richard Daly's task force on property tax reform. Michael attended Harvard University as an undergraduate and earned a degree as a double major in government and economics with cum laude distinction. He earned his Juris Doctorate from the University of Chicago Law School. Michael, uh, I would like to turn things over to you now. Thank you so much for looking really forward Thank to you. this tonight. Thank you, uh, and I appreciate it, and I hope uh, everyone uh, can hear me well. If you could just give me a thumbs up, Carla. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm going to begin sh sharing my screen, um, and uh, these are the slides I'll be uh, presenting uh, today. Um, I will make these slides available. Uh, so uh, I know that's always one of the first questions that people ask, um, can we see the slides? So yes, uh, you will be able to uh, see the slides after the presentation. Um, so uh, first thing first is uh, this little note on the left-hand side. Uh, what we're talking about today is for informational purposes only. It's, it's our legal disclaimer. We will not, and I will not be uh, providing any legal advice uh, through this uh, presentation. Um, and that, the reason is that uh, individuals' facts and circumstances um, really can impact um, uh, the advice that we give. And uh, in order to give that advice, we want to make sure that we fully understand um, all the facts of your individual circumstances. Um, so if you have a question um, that uh, starts drifting into legal advice, I will uh, politely say that um, I won't be able to give that uh, answer to that question, um, but we'd be happy to if you qualify for our, our legal services um, to answer that in a different form. Um, and, and thinking about the title for this, uh, we, we really wanted to stress um, the uh, concept of intergenerational wealth and um, really want you uh, to think about uh, or ask the question to yourself, what is the plan for your home? Um, so think about that throughout the, uh, the, um, the presentation. What is the plan for your home? So as far as uh, topics that we're going to uh, talk on today, we're going to talk a little bit about the place that I work, the Center for Disability and Elder Law. We're going to talk about the case types that we have and the uh, different programs um, that we uh, conduct those uh, case types through. Uh, primarily, we're going to talk about estate planning. 
um, and uh, we're going to touch on uh, some different areas. Um, we're not going to cover all areas of estate planning. Um, way too long of a presentation for us to uh, talk about that, but particularly focusing on uh, things that involve uh, transfer of your home after you pass away. And to do that, we're going to talk about um, some uh, maybe familiar or not so familiar topics such as probate and probate court, um, the effect of having a last will and testament, um, and planning for your home and options, and uh, particularly one option that we uh, find very helpful for our clients, the transfer on death instruments. And then, as uh, Carla said, we'll provide some time for questions at the end. So a little uh, commercial about the place that I work for, um, the Center for Disability and Elder Law. We are a nonprofit, 501c3, founded in 1984. We've been around uh, for a long time, well, ready to celebrate our 40th anniversary. Um, we were generated out of the uh, Chicago Bar Association's Young Lawyers section um, after a study found that 100% of those living in poverty will experience at least one legal problem that they cannot obtain legal uh, representation. Um, that's a shocking statistic that everyone um, living in poverty uh, has a legal problem that they will not be able to find legal services for. And that's why uh, a place like our uh, entity exists. Um, in particular, we are um, serving uh, low and moderate income individuals who are either 60 years of age or older or an adult living with a disability. Um, so our mission is to provide those free legal services um, to those identified groups, but we're also here to foster the spirit of pro bono service. If we have any uh, attorneys on uh, the line, we are uh, always looking for um, different uh, volunteers to help us um, accomplish our mission and, and make sure that we can deliver uh, legal services um, to individuals. Um, we're a relatively small staff, but yet um, we leverage ourselves through uh, pro bono services and, and volunteers. In 2021 alone, we closed over 2,000 files. So um, we have a number of different practice areas um, at the uh, Center for Disability and Elder Law, CEDL. Um, what we're talking about today is a state and end of life planning. Um, those documents can be uh, powers of attorney, such, such as the power of attorney for health care, power of attorney for property, uh, a living will declaration, um, which is a statement about uh, your desires at the end of life. Um, the last will and testament, which we are going to touch on um, here, but mostly we're going to talk about uh, transfer on death instruments, um, or I would call them toadies, as uh, we often refer to them. Aside from estate and end-of-life planning, uh, we uh, do work around housing and other real property issues. Um, so we handle landlord-tenant disputes. Um, we do a lot with respect to evictions and eviction defense, um, whether representing uh, small landlords um, seeking eviction or uh, uh, representing tenants who are um, subject of eviction. Uh, we have other uh, landlord um, uh, disputes that we deal with, um, security deposits, uh, um, and uh, also more generally um, property issues such as um, issues with title uh, and building code violations. Um, our third large, largest area is um, adult guardianship, um, adult guardianship of the person, um, uh, where our, our typical scenario is we're representing either a, a parent who is seeking the guardianship of a uh, child who has recently turned 18 but needs a legal representative because of uh, some disability, or uh, representing a parent uh, or a child who is seeking um, guardianship of a parent um, who is uh, suffering um, from issues that are uh, leading to incapacity. Aside from those three big areas, we do simple divorces uh, and uh, relative um, um, some issues regarding collection and uh, consumer debts. Uh, we accomplish this uh, through a, a number of different programs. Um, we have community clinics um, located throughout uh, Cook County. Um, our main offices are downtown on uh, Randolph uh, Street, um, but we have community clinics uh, throughout, uh, geographically located throughout Cook County, um, kind of sparsed out um, in 10 different locations. And we also have uh, two um, community clinics that are um, uh, targeted for uh, specific groups of people. One um, is the Power to Thrive Clinic at the Center on Addison, um, who uh, that is there to sell, uh, particularly serve the LGBT plus community. 
And we also have a, a veterans uh, legal clinics at uh, the Jesse Brown VA Medical Center and Heinz VA Hospitals, um, where we uh, service uh, veterans. We have one particular project um, called the Housing Preservation Project, where we uh, address housing matters and homeownership uh, matters. That's what this presentation is part of. And aside from that, we do uh, um, presentations very similar to this on power of attorneys and uh, adult guardianships as well. To be eligible for our services, so beyond uh, presenting um, at a uh, information session like this, if uh, we were to represent you, you must uh, qualify for our services, which means that you must be a resident of Cook County or a, an Illinois veteran. So if you're a veteran um, and you live outside of Cook County, we may uh, be able to represent you depending on what your legal age is. Uh, you must be over the age of 60 for us or living with a permanent disability. Um, you must be low or moderate income, and, and what that actually means uh, really depends on the legal service that you're asking for us. Um, it's uh, tied in with um, who is funding that particular legal service, and it must be uh, one of the legal issues that, that we um, normally deal with. If you recall, that list had lots of civil uh, issues. We don't do anything criminal, so if you are uh, looking for criminal services, um, we are not the agency. But usually if we are not able to help someone uh, who is low or moderate income, we try to find a uh, legal aid partner who is able um, to help you. So um, the question is, what is probate, um, uh, probate court? Uh, it's a topic or, or a, a, a word that you're probably familiar with, um, but unless you've actually had to deal with it, um, you may not exactly understand what that uh, what it actually is. Probate is that process where the court supervises the distribution of your assets after you pass away. Um, and uh, the court will, uh, in order to do that, the court will uh, choose someone um, to uh, ensure that the uh, decedent's debts are paid and their assets are um, distributed to their beneficiaries or heirs and that will either happen um, through an administrator, um, that is a person uh, who is appointed when there is no will, or an executor, um, that is the person who has been named in the will um, to carry out the decedent, the person who's passed away's wishes. If you've heard of probate and haven't experienced it yourself, the one thing you've probably heard is that it's really expensive and it takes a lot of time. Um, there are reasons for that. Uh, one is that, uh, in general, um, what, when an administrator or executor is taking care of um, a, uh, a probate matter, um, they typically will have to post a bond, which is usually one and a half to two times the amount of the value, the estimated value of the estate. Um, those bonds cost uh, money um, in and of itself. Um, but uh, even more is that um, in order for most bond companies to issue a, uh, a bond to an administrator or an executor, um, they usually uh, or typically require um, that person have an attorney in Illinois um, and or in Cook County. And um, the attorneys um, can be expensive um, depending on the amount of time and complexity of the probate matter. So when, is, uh, when and why is probate necessary? Um, well, for estates that are valued over $100,000 or involve real property that needs to be transferred, um, probate is going to be required. Um, in addition, if there is uh, some dispute among uh, family members or heirs about who gets what, um, probate may be required. If there are um, certain unknown debts that may be required, or if there's a dispute about, um, for example, the will and, and whether there's uh, undue influence in the drafting of the will, that will re uh, require uh, probate. There are, there are alternatives to probate. Uh, one uh, alternative is uh, using a small estate affidavit. Um, that allows a, uh, a, a state that is valued less, less than $100,000 um, or um, if there, and or if there is no real property um, that is involved in the estate and they know there's no disputes and there's um, no question about what bills uh, will be paid or are, have been paid. Um, because of the conditions of the small estate affidavit, um, it's often desirable um, to both reduce the size uh, of the value of the estate and to make sure that um, at least uh, real estate is not passed through um, um, probate. 
And that's when we kick in as to um, uh, what um, ways about uh, and discussions about how to reduce that 100,000 limit. Um, so uh, things that pass through probate are um, things uh, with a bit, uh, that require beneficiary. Um, so items without a beneficiary won't go and, and that won't be passing through po probate court will not be included in that $100,000 limit. Um, for example, um, bank accounts. That bank accounts can be held in your name only, or it can be a joint account, or it can be a payment on death account, um, or uh, uh, certain um, in insurance policies won't, won't pass through uh, uh, probate. Those things that aren't uh, um, uh, passing through probate and, and uh, things that are strategically um, made so they won't uh, pass through probate um, can reduce the amount, the value of your state so that you can uh, have uh, an estate that's less than that $100,000 limit. Um, things that are excluded from uh, the $100,000 limit, I already uh, covered uh, payment on death accounts, um, but you can also exclude things like uh, your vehicle. And, um, you can make your uh, vehicle actually transfer on your death as, as well. Um, all things that uh, you really want to um, uh, meet with a, either a financial advisor or an attorney um, to discuss ways to that you may want to consider in reducing the uh, what value actually passes um, through uh, uh, probate. So some common questions. If we were in person, I would um, be um, doing a pop quiz right now. Um, but since we don't, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, um, common question we see is uh, people say, I have a will, um, that means I don't have to uh, go through probate. Um, no, that's not correct. Um, having a will on its own is not enough to avoid probate. Um, it is the size of your state um, that will determine whether or not you have to go through probate. Um, and it's, uh, you know, using one, uh, that small state as David is uh, definitely a way, um, particularly um, for our low income individuals, um, a way of avoiding that. If you pass without a will in Illinois, um, the Illinois Intestate Succession Act um, will decide who uh, gets what. Uh, another pop question, uh, quiz question is, um, people often say, um, I do not have a will, so the state of Illinois gets my property, right? Um, no, that's not correct either. Um, if you pass, uh, again, if you pass away without a will, um, the Illinois Intestate Succession Act, Act decides who gets what, and usually it goes to um, your closest kin or your closest relatives, um, uh, and there's an hierarchy that the Succession Act follows, um, but only if no kin can be found um, does your home uh, go to the county and everything else uh, goes to the state of Illinois. Um, so all good reasons to make sure that you have a plan, particularly have a plan for your home. So why is planning for your home so important? It is a very, uh, I want to share a typical uh, Chicago scenario. Um, so uh, uh, husband and wife uh, buy a, a Chicago bungalow um, and um, spend their life in that Chicago bungalow, raise their, their family of four in that uh, bungalow and uh, choose to age in place in that same house. Um, at some point, um, perhaps uh, mom and dad uh, need some additional assistance. So one of the children moves in with them. <coughs> um, one of the children actually moves into to the house. Uh, perhaps eventually mom passes away, uh, daughter is still living in the house, um, taking care of uh, dad. Um, and, and eventually dad moves away and daughter is living in the home. Um, uh, brothers and sisters are okay with that. Daughter continues to live in the home. Perhaps her children actually move in um, and um, uh, eventually daughter moves away uh, or uh, passes away. And um, that next generation is living in the, the family home. Very common scenario that the people living in the home are not actually the people on title to the home. And that's usually thought of, it's not a problem until it becomes a problem, right? Um, 
So what does it mean when you're not entitled to the home and you're living there? Well, you can't refinance that home. Um, you're not entitled to take a certain property tax exemptions um, and reducing the size of your property taxes. Um, when you need to withdraw equity in the home to make uh, necessary repairs, um, that's not, uh, the person living there isn't able to do that then. Um, and most importantly, uh, they can't sell the home. In addition, it creates all kinds of uh, airship problems um, down the road as to uh, who is um, entitled um, to uh, the ownership interest in the home. Um, we see some very complex uh, scenarios uh, when it's uh, you know two, three generations uh, of not fixing um, being on title to the property, um, including uh, problems of trying to track down some of the potential errors um, and uh, complexities as to uh, how much ownership interest each person actually is entitled to. So some options to remove um, the property um, from probate. Uh, one is uh, the, um, a, a quick claim deed. Um, by adding uh, another person as a home. So, uh, for example, if I own uh, my own home, I can quit claim my home to myself and my daughter as joint tenants. Um, that means that uh, once I pass away, um, my daughter actually automatically becomes uh, ownership of the home, depending on how we've uh, structured uh, that quit claim deed. Um, that is a, a very common um, tool that uh, individuals use, um, there are some disadvantages um, to that. Um, sometimes uh, the relationship between my, myself and my daughter um, changes over time and um, it becomes, it can become hard to remove your daughter from your, uh, your uh, deed. Um, there are also steps that daughter can take um, to uh, actually um, strengthen her interest uh, in the property. So it is not a quick claim, uh, adding a person to uh, a deed as a um, another person on the deed is not always a good choice um, for uh, individuals. And again, it, it really depends on facts and circumstances. Um, another option um, that uh, people are always curious about um, or have questions about are putting uh, the property into trust. Um, that is uh, um, uh, a, a way of ensuring that uh, the uh, property passes um, without uh, any further steps once the property is into trust. Um, and, and it's usually accomplished by making um, your heirs, your beneficiaries of the trust. So you, uh, uh, you would remain the primary beneficiary and your your, uh, uh, your children, for example, would become a uh, secondary beneficiaries um, of the trust and uh, they, therefore they would automatically become the beneficiaries after you pass away. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages um, to a trust document, uh, including uh, the cost in setting up the trust. Um, and um, typically a trust will have a, um, a entity that manages the trust and those, there can also be uh, additional fees in that. Um, uh, there are uh, various, it, it can be uh, complexities that uh, intertwine with um, whether or not you have a mortgage on the property, um, all things that um, get to be very fact specific um, to your individual uh, situation. So something you certainly want to uh, consider carefully in a, in a fact specific way um, with your uh, financial or um, legal counsel. When your uh, properties are in trust, you will often see um, uh, there, there's no longer a quick claim deed or um, or any other kind of deed. It becomes a trustee's deed. Um, so it's very possible that some of you already have that, um, that you already have a trustee's deed um, and uh, you may have already uh, owned the property through a trust. The final uh, topic that I, I want to talk on um, as ways to um, address probate is this transfer on death instrument. Um, and um, it is an item that we uh, find very useful for our clients um, who, again, are most are, uh, low income uh, seniors and persons with disability. Um, and um, uh, there's certain advantages there that uh, we uh, particularly find it useful um, for clients of our style. So, 
So um, this uh, slide gives you a nice comparison of um, these different um, types of options. Uh, so, um, you know, basic questions of um, what happens with ownership in each of these different types of scenarios. Um, as I mentioned, when you are in a joint uh, ownership situation, um, uh, you no longer just own the uh, property by yourself. You're owning that uh, with um, that uh, child, for example. Um, and uh, that's great if uh, the relationship uh, is great with your children um, or, and it stays that way, um, not always um, the situation for everyone. Uh, you know, ownership in a trust, the trust actually owns it, um, which can uh, uh, add some complexity with things like mortgages, um, all things that you can want to consider carefully with your uh, legal and um, uh, your legal and financial advisors. Um, in contrast with transfer and death instrument, um, you actually retain ownership there. Um, one of the beauties of it is that um, you don't have to uh, give up ownership, and it's a really a, a document that only becomes effective um, when uh, the owner passes away. Um, you can see a comparison of fees and, and the costs and ongoing costs there. Um, uh, the other uh, significant advantage um, that we like to point out with the transfer on death instrument is that um, once you uh, sign it, once you uh, enter into that transfer on death instrument, nothing actually happens until you pass away. Um, so it doesn't have an immediate effect that you do see on um, some of these other uh, documents. Um, sometimes, uh, particularly uh, when you uh, do a quit claim deed, it can trigger certain um, activities. It, it triggers uh, something sometimes at the, uh, the assessor's office, for example, in terms of your exemptions. Um, so uh, because of those immediate effects, and that happens with a, a trust deed as well, um, it, there might be, it, it's not a, it's typically not a problem that you can't overcome, but it may require you uh, to do steps and uh, others may be notified. And just something, again, that you can, should consider as you consider uh, these different options. Um, the beauty of all of these is that uh, you can um, avoid probate. And again, um, if your goal is to uh, reduce the size of your probate estate down to that um, below $100,000 limit so that your heirs can um, use the small estate affidavit and avoid probate. Um, taking your property out of it um, is a certain advantage, and each one of these three um, can accomplish that goal. One other thing is to um, consider uh, creditors. Um, the impact of not only your creditors, but in the case of a joint ownership, uh, the creditors of your um, of a joint owner, um, particularly if the joint owner has debts, um, the creditor could um, start recording liens against your property, something very um, important to consider. Um, again, a beauty of the transfer on death instrument doesn't affect those things because it really doesn't uh, have an effect until after you pass away. And finally, um, one thing always consider is um, whether or not uh, the impact on any outstanding mortgages that you have. Um, you should definitely consult your uh, lender if you are considering um, a, uh, a joint or a, a quick claim deed or, or, or trust. Um, in in most, many cases, it's something that uh, um, lenders are very used to and uh, will work with you um, through. Um, in some cases, it can be, um, become complex, but it all uh, depends on your individual lender and something that you um, should definitely uh, consider um, as you uh, move through the process and reach out to your lender. This is a great comparison document of all those different types of um, uh, advanced directive estate planning documents um, that uh, we talked about in the beginning. Um, and uh, it also compares um, um, the transfer on death instrument to TOTI. Um, it, it, it's um, illustrative of the fact that um, with respect to the TOTI, um, it's, it's, it's a document for home, homeowners, and it applies after you pass away. So um, it, um, during your lifetime um, of the owners, it really does not uh, or should not impact um, the property itself or your ownership. So one of the things um, I started out by saying 
um, at the beginning of this is that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're not here to provide um, legal advice. We're, we're here to distribute information um, about these uh, different options and um, op opportunities of addressing uh, the planning for your home. But most importantly, is that uh, no one size fits all. So um, while we uh, are, are very, um, uh, we believe that transfer on death instrument is an important planning tool, um, particularly for uh, low income individuals. Um, and um, it becomes a, a quick and um, cheap way of making a plan for your home. Um, it is really uh, something you want to consider your own individual circumstances and uh, really um, uh, meet with an attorney uh, to talk about each of these options and which one really works best in your situation. Um, our, our focus is in this presentation is on um, the home, um, but other things can uh, impact your uh, your analysis and, and what you want to consider, whether you have um, other debts out there, whether you have um, other assets, whether you own more than one property. Um, all those things um, you want to consider as you uh, plan for that intergenerational transfer of wealth, um, of, of that equity that's in your home. Um, so I'm not going to stop the, 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 um, the advantages of the transfer on death instrument, um, but uh, just to uh, go further into it, um, the transfer on death instrument is a, a, a short document. It looks um, very much like a deed. It's uh, typically uh, one or two pages. Um, and uh, it is uh, something that uh, is um, easy for lawyers um, to draft. Um, there is a fee um, to record uh, the transfer on death instrument. That's uh, $50 plus $4 um, if you're recording it uh, electronically. That's the Cook County Recorder's Office. Um, charges. Um, and in order for a transfer on death instrument to be effective, it must be recorded before the homeowner passes away. Um, so it's uh, like many um, estate planning documents, uh, it's one of those items that you don't want to put off. You want to uh, address um, now when you can, as opposed to when uh, uh, later on um, when uh, it's too late. Um, the transfer on death instrument itself um, names uh, beneficiary or beneficiaries um, to receive the home after you pass away. Um, very much like a will, uh, you will uh, name uh, individuals uh, to receive your home and uh, it can be um, structured in different ways um, as to uh, whether or not um, individuals re uh, receive it um, at the same time or uh, you can structure it if um, uh, it's excessive where uh, um, one person would inherit it, but if that person passes away, a, a different person, person inherits it, um, much like uh, a will. Again, the, um, the importance of um, the transfer and death instrument is that it avoids probate and it uh, reduces the size of that small estate, after, um, or it reduces the size of your estate um, and may entitle you to be able to, or your heirs to use um, the small estate affidavit, um, which will uh, reduce the cost of, um, uh, of having to go through probate and um, it actually saves on a lot of time as well. But the, I think the most important thing about uh, the transfer and death instrument or my favorite um, uh, advantage of the transfer and death instrument is that if you change your mind, you can undo it as long as you have the mental capacity to do so. So uh, if you decide that uh, transfer and death instrument is great now um, and you go through the process, you record it um, uh, and your estate plan is in place and next week you decide, nope, the transfer and death instrument is not for you, you can um, easily undo it. Um, and uh, it, it requir requires recording another uh, document to say that you're undoing that transfer on death instrument, um, but it is a very simple process um, uh, to, to do. Those other steps, uh, much uh, those other uh, steps of transferring your home, such as the quit claim deed or the trust, um, more difficult to change your mind, more difficult to undo uh, once you've taken that step.
So if you are um, looking to record a uh, transfer and death instrument, it's a fairly simple process. Um, it's uh, through the Cook County, um, we're talking Cook County here, but uh, through the Cook County Recorders Division and the Recorder of Deeds Office, or formerly the Recorder of Deeds Office, it's now all one body. Um, it's downtown in Chicago. Um, it's a very uh, simple uh, uh, step. You you take the, uh, the document, you pay your $54, and then um, eventually it'll show up on the um, the Cook County Recorder's website showing that uh, you have recorded it. it. Uh, recording is uh, really a way of saying that you've made it public um, to the world um, that you have uh, indicated um, that this document exists. You can also mail those uh, documents to the Cook County Clerk's Office. Um, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, during COVID, it was, um, uh, uh, more challenging for the Cook County Recorder uh, and, and dealing with your mail. I think things are fine now, um, but um, I know we always prefer to do it in person just because of the complications of, of mailing. So who can do it, Tony? Um, we have this question um, often in um, estate planning uh, situations. Um, someone will say, I want to do a um, a power of attorney for my dad, or I want to do a will for my mom, or I want to do a toady for uh, my uncle. Well, um, that's not possible. Only the homeowner or homeowners um, can do a toady. So uh, they must have the mental capacity um, to do that, uh, to um, draft or request the uh, toady be drafted and to uh, the mental capacity to sign um, the document. And, and they must want to do it um, for themselves. So um, if you're the homeowner, um, that's great. Um, if you are not the homeowner, um, but you think someone would take advantage of it um, or uh, could take advantage of this document, um, they will need um, to take that step um, for themselves. So um, last plug for us, um, for those who qualify for our services, um, we actually draft these uh, transfer on de um, death instruments for free. Um, you can you can go to uh, many attorneys um, who are, are who deal in real estate or uh, who deal with estate planning, and they will um, uh, draft those uh, for you as well. Um, they typically charge a fee. Uh, we are um, uh, funded by various sources, and um, as long as you qualify for our services, uh, we are able to draft those documents for free. I put in my uh, email address here, and there's another slide that has um, uh, my more general contact information. Um, so um, there are two ways uh, that we uh, uh, work on um, these uh, items for individuals. One is reaching out to us directly. Um, if you want to reach out to us directly, um, you call that number there, that 376-1880. Um, however, we also have um, a a workshop that we're um, uh, planning on June 1st uh, from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Um, that is an opportunity to be in person where you will work with uh, a legal professional, either a, uh, an attorney or um, some other legal professional, um, usually one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. Um, they work on drafting uh, your documents with you. Uh, they, they may go through um, answer your questions. Um, and the and, uh, second step is when we actually uh, sign those documents. Um, but uh, we work on those documents um, so that you can actually uh, get them done in a, um, in a quick and hopefully uh, efficient manner. Uh, we used to uh, offer these um, kind of workshops where you would, uh, you would just uh, have the opportunity to just show up and um, meet with a, an attorney. And unfortunately, uh, due to COVID protocols, um, we like to keep our uh, the size of these workshops um, relatively small. Um, so that means we do that uh, by appointment only. Um, so uh, in order to uh, participate in this uh, particular workshop, you would need um, to uh, um, have an appointment and you uh, can get an appointment with us either um, by uh, reaching out to me at this um, email address or you can actually call um, and uh, this phone number and mention that you're uh, particularly interested in uh, the June 1 uh, um, workshop. Um, because uh, we would be working with um, you and providing uh, legal advice uh, with a legal professional, uh, 
it, it is something that you must be eligible for our services. Again, that is um, uh, 60 and older, or uh, uh, someone who, or if you have a permanent uh, disability. Um, um, and most importantly, uh, you must be qualified in terms of our income guidelines. Um, when uh, you call, we will conduct a, a screening um, to see if you if you are in fact um, eligible for for our services. Um, if you think if you're not sure whether you are, um, we always encourage people to call anyway, um, and uh, we will uh, try to answer the question for you. A lot of times, um, sometimes we're not able to help someone, but again, we always try to find someone who is able um, to help you. And that's it. That's my contact information. Um, I don't, yeah, no, uh, no more uh, topics I was intending to cover today. Um, and I think I'm two minutes early, so uh, I will open it up for Q and A. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, that was so helpful, uh, and we do have some really great questions as well. Uh, since you just mentioned the workshop, we did have the question that came up of where will the workshop be held? Uh, so if you want to address that first. Yes, um, so uh, we had a workshop uh, location all set up, but unfortunately um, they um, they uh, canceled on it on us. So we are actually looking for, we're looking at a, both a, um, a north side and a uh, south side location for the workshop. And we're going to choose uh, depending on um, the level of interest. So if you're on the south side of, uh, of the city um, uh, or, or the north side, please reach out to us and um, we will um, uh, schedule uh, the location dependent on um, where the interest lies. Um, at, uh, depending on the level of interest, we might uh, have to um, cap the number of time, uh, people that we see on June 1st. But if that uh, happens, um, not to worry, we'll, uh, we'll create another workshop and we'll uh, help uh, people on a different day. It's a really amazing opportunity. Um, uh, okay, let's delve into some of these. I, I answered a few of them along the way, but uh, we've got some other good ones. Um, one person wondered if, they, if it was possible to get um, brochures and printed literature to pass out at community events, uh, you know, just about the things that you spoke about tonight. Um, absolutely. Uh, we have a, a lot of brochures. Um, reach out to me at uh, that email address. Um, we have printed brochures. We have other literature that we like to uh, send out, including um, some digital information. We also do tabling events. If, if you have an event um, and you want uh, people to, um, uh, or if you have tables and, and, and have people answer questions about their services, we do that as well. Great. Uh, okay, so now we've got some nitty gritty questions. Um, if I add a family member to the deed on my home, would that give them the right the rights to the home after I pass? Um, so it, it's one of those um, uh, very specific questions and, and it's um, depending on the language in uh, the uh, deed itself. Um, but um, in general, that is the benefit of uh, those joint um, uh, ownership documents of that quick claim deed is um, to have it pass um, from that, uh, you know, the original owner to uh, that person that you've added to your deed um, so that it, it happens automatically. Okay, so it might be worth checking out though with a little bit extra to make sure that that's all, all the ducks are in a yeah, row on that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you have a trust, do you need a will? Um, so I'm going to say it depends, and again, I'm going to <laughs> fall back on that. Um, it, it really depends on your, your facts and circumstances and uh, what other items that you own. I would say in general, you should have a will. People should have a will. Everyone over 18 should have a will, um, even if you don't um, think that your assets are that valuable. You should have a will because um, a will is your in, um, your way to control about who will get what you want. And you want to, uh, it should be things, even the non-valuable things should pass to who you want them to go to. Um, that said, you know, certain family situations, it's, it's not an issue, but, um, but my general recommendation is for people to have a will. Okay. Um, and some of these things I, I, I know were sort of addressed along the way, but uh, people have missed parts of it. I've seen the numbers go up and down. So um, uh, my mother passed some time ago and her house sits in a trust now. Can I transfer the title in my name now? 
after she's passed. Um, so uh, again, we're, we're drifting into that um, legal um, advice uh, situation. I'll, I'll talk, talk about how a trust generally works. Um, a trust usually is set up so that um, it passes to um, the beneficiary. So the trust will still exist after uh, the parent passes away, um, the, but the beneficiaries are now um, the new beneficiaries. The children um, are um, the owners of the property. Um, if you want to get out of that trust, get out of the cost of those trusts, um, that's certainly something possible. You'll need to talk with a lawyer or financial advisor to do that. Um, if we don't qualify for your services, can you recommend an attorney or an estate planner? Um, so we don't recommend individual attorneys. Um, there's just um, complexity and, and ethical issues in recommending um, particular individuals. Um, sometimes we uh, are not able to service individuals, but we know of another legal aid agency that can help, and we do make those recommendations. Um, if you, we can't find a legal aid agency, we will uh, generally tell you where to go to find an attorney, um, a private attorney, um, and we have, usually have some suggestions about that. But we won't recommend an individual person or firm. Um, can you do a toady on property that has a mortgage? That is the beauty of the toady, is that um, the toady <laughs> does not uh, impact that mortgage. Um, now, when you uh, when you pass away and um, the ownership actually transfers um, uh, through that toady, they will have to address the mortgage then. Um, but the toady itself, when you execute it, doesn't impact that mortgage. Okay, uh, my husband passed. How do I change the name on the deed? Um, so there are steps that you will have to take, I and mean, it depends on, in part, on whether you're in the city or um, in um, uh, elsewhere in the state of Illinois. Um, there's usually some costs involved in either um, recording it, or uh, it depends on where you are. Sometimes um, the uh, um, government will have certain um, steps and that you have to um, do before you can actually um, clear up that title. That is something that we actually do do if you um, qualify for our services. Um, so uh, if you have a specific step um, and you qualify, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay, um, where, can, where can you find the legal description for the property that has to be included on the TODI form? And it says in parentheses, online at the Cook, online at Cook County website. Um, so if you want to uh, get the official legal description, um, you can get it from uh, the Cook County Recorder's Office. Um, they charge you, I think it's five bucks um, for um, a printout of what that uh, uh, legal description is. So you can also usually find it in your old deed. So um, when you originally bought your house, uh, you um, there was an actual deed document, um, and you can usually find that online. Um, Unless it is prior to, you purchased it prior to 1987, um, and in which case you actually have to um, physically go to the Cook County Recorder's Office and, and get a copy, a physical copy of the, uh, the deed. But um, typically, your legal description is in um, that original deed itself. It also is sometimes included in um, the mortgage um, uh, or uh, other documents that you may have um, uh, uh, had with respect to your home, um, um, you know, if there, if the lien, a lien might have included um, the legal description as well, for example. Um, but um, it's typically in multiple locations, but if you really want the official copy, you go to the, uh, the Cook and Recorder office and um, um, pay that five bucks to get a copy of it. Um, if you own your home jointly with your spouse, can you do a toady for if you both pass? Um, we do uh, a lot of joint toadies. Um, it's uh, uh, usually set up where um, you're both executing um, the same document that saves you um, 50 bucks on the recording fee. Um, and it's uh, structured so that, um, uh, you know, uh, after the last individual passes away, then the beneficiaries uh, kick in. Um, so if you're a husband and wife and um, husband passes away first, wife will still continue to own the property. But once wife passes away, then the beneficiaries uh, would inherit um, the property. 
Um, there can be. Um, are we still on? Yep. Um, there can be a, a, a little, a few complications um, when that happens. Um, so there are some things that you want to uh, carefully consider um, in talking with your attorney, um, but that's generally how it works. Okay. Um, what is the universal hierarchy of beneficiaries, and what about step brothers or half brothers? Um, so um, I, I think what, what you're wanting to uh, discuss is um, in, intestate um, succession act um, and uh, who uh, inherits in terms when there is no will. Yeah, that's what I mean. um, and uh, the, the law has uh, ways of, of dealing with um, non-blood relatives. Um, at, at certain points, they are um, on the same level as um, certain, but it, again, it's very uh, fact specific. So I don't want to um, go too deep into whether or not um, a stepbrother um, or half brother would inherit. Um, it, it is something worth uh, talking with the lawyer about. Um, another person, uh, I am not 60, I am 40 and not married, but I am the sole owner of my home and want my long-term girlfriend to have ownership if something were to happen to me since I have no other family. Um, so what would you do in a situation like that? Um, so, uh, you know, a toady is um, a great uh, document no matter what your age is. So it's not limited to um, someone that's at 60. It's just that um, in order to qualify for our services, um, you wouldn't qualify uh, as uh, someone who is 40. Um, you know, these, um, a lot of state planning um, are great uh, documents for um, having um, your wishes known and be carried out for uh, non non family for your chosen family. Um, so, um, you know, something like a toady is, is a great instrument for uh, um, transferring your home to non family or um, powers of attorney. Also, I always point out as as a way to make sure that um, your non family is, a, is in a position to make decisions on your behalf when you lose capacity. Um, so, definitely um, great instruments for you. Um, just you wouldn't be in, uh, eligible for our services. Um, there might be uh, legal aids that uh, might be able to help you um, um, even at uh, 40 years old, just not us. And you just, I think, answered a question um, about power of attorney as well with that response. Um, if a homeowner has okay. given power of attorney to someone, can the homeowner still do a toady and sign it themselves? Absolutely. Um, you can still do it. Um, that's the... Uh, um, I want to be cautious here. Uh, I want to know. I would want to know uh, when you say it, you've given a power of attorney, whether that um, whether that means that you've actually just signed it and that uh, a power of attorney has um, become effective. I'd also want to know about your uh, your capacity to enter into uh, uh, an agreement. But in general, those documents don't prohibit you from entering into a toady. Um, and you can fill out a toady yourself and just walk it over to the recorder of deeds, right? Uh, you can't. Um, it is, um, I mean, it's really designed to be a very simple form. Um, and again, it looks very much like the deed to your house. Um, there are uh, many forms. I think the Cook County Recorder even has a form on its website um, for, the, for that type of document. A lot of people uh, don't feel comfortable with that process or they worry, particularly when it comes to the legal description, they worry about getting that exactly right. Um, that's why uh, we uh, provide those services uh, through a workshop where you get to work with an attorney, you can ask questions, you can make sure that the document's done right. Um, but you know, for, for many people, um, particularly uh, people used to um, dealing with these types of documents, um, it is something that they can do themselves. But, but you cannot do it for someone else. Um, you, you, a non-attorney cannot uh, draft it for uh, someone else. Um, can you put the house in trust separate for your child? Wait, can you put the house in trust separate for your child, separate from a special needs trust? Um, so so uh, they're talking okay. about special needs trust that um, involves uh, usually um, is set up for uh, a child. Um, or an individual um, uh, who is, uh, um, we, we typically see it when, when an individual um, has a disability. Very, very specific, um, a fact specific um, question there. I, I, I wouldn't want to um, try to answer that in this forum. Um, I really want to know some um, facts behind it. 
Uh, does joint ownership of the home require legal capacity, i.e. would require that I don't have guardianship over my son as co-owner? Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Just the um, okay. So um, in order to enter in any sort of um, agreement contract, um, you must have uh, capacity. Um, you must be able to um, uh, enter into that agreement. Um, um, it has to happen at the time um, that you're entering into an agreement and, uh, you know, it depends on the agreement, what level and how they determine whether or not you have capacity, which I think is um, what the question is, is getting at. Um, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know for, for sure. That is one of the downfalls with the Q&A format here. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'm thinking that you can add a toady to your living trust. Is that correct? Your all-inclusive trust. Okay. Um, so I, I think you're mixing up some um, terms here. Uh, there is um, a trust um, in which uh, you can have uh, own your property, your your home through, uh, in which case you you have someone who manages the trust and you have beneficiaries. Uh, usually you're a beneficiary, but after you pass away, you um, uh, name some successor uh, beneficiaries. There's also something called a living will. A living will is really um, uh, talking about what uh, your in, uh, intents for um, are at end of life um, and how uh, what steps should be taken in terms of uh, your um, uh, what should be happening at the end of your life. Trust versus toady, um, they're not compatible. Um, so you're either doing a you're either doing a toady or you're either putting your owning your property uh, um, through a trust. Um, again, starting to get into a little bit of specifics as to um, which which is best for you, which I think is kind of what the uh, question is getting at. Um, something you want to uh, really uh, have considered carefully um, with your legal representative. Uh, time for one or two more questions here. And just to remind everybody, okay. we um, we will be sending out a follow-up email that's going to have a recording of all of this so you can see all the slides again and Michael's explanations of everything, um, all the Q&A, everything um, in, that, in that regard as well. And also be sure to call him if you're interested in that June 1st uh, or email, um, that June 1st session where they'll be doing things in person as well. Um, there is a limited number of people. So um, okay. Uh, I, I know you had a chart about this too, but I, I think it's important. Which will cost less for my family in passing my home after death, a trust or a toady in terms of beneficiaries and policies? Yeah. Um, so in general, um, without going into the specifics of an individual, in general, the reason we like toady so much is that it is usually the lowest cost, least um, difficult to transfer um, items. Um, a trust can be set up um, so that it happens automatically um, once a person passes away. So no cost in actually transferring the, the properties. But you will have costs in maintaining the trust, paying that person who's managing the trust, for example, which is usually a, a bank or, or some entity who's uh, been chosen to uh, manage the trust. Um, as long as that trust continues, um, that uh, entity will continue to need to be paid. Toady, on the other hand, um, really has uh, two costs. Um, after there's the cost of, well, there's three costs. There's the cost of preparing the toady if, if you um, go to a lawyer or if you um, come to an agency like ourselves, it's free. There's cost to record the toady that needs, that recording fee that needs to happen um, before the person passes away and it still has um, capacity. And then after the person passes away, there's another document that the heirs re uh, record um, to say that they are now the owners of the property. Um, and that's another, uh, that's $50 to record it um, before the person passes away and another $50 um, to pass, um, uh, to record it after the person passes away. Um, that is usually a much less fee than anything that you would pay um, in any of these other um, uh, different uh, aspects. But again, um, things can change depending on your individual circumstances. All right. Well, we are a minute after seven. So um, okay. again, uh, all of the questions uh, 
we didn't get to tonight, um, we're cutting them off now, but we'll save them and uh, send out those responses in the follow-up email you guys should be getting in about a week or so, sometime within, within the week um, as well. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, this is a much sought after information for a lot of people we talk to on a regular basis and really, really appreciate your time. Well, thanks. I, I enjoyed uh, being here and enjoyed presenting to such a great group. And I do hope that we're able to help a lot of you on uh, June 1st or another date if we are, if June 1st doesn't work out. Sounds great. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a lovely night. Get out in the weather while it's still warm. Um, and we'll see you soon at the next seminar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.